open almost any book on the Buddhist teachings. And one of the things you'll find is a statement to the effect that one of his central teachings is about the three characteristics. The characteristic of inconstancy, the characteristics of stress or suffering, and the characteristic of not-self. The strange thing, though, is that you look in the Pali Canon and the word three characteristics doesn't appear. Do a search and try, type in, say, the characteristic of inconstancy, anicca lakana, and it comes up nothing. It's not in the Pali Canon at all. The same with dukkha lakana, anatta lakana. Those compounds don't appear. Now, this is not to say that the three, these three things, don't appear in the Canon at all, but they're not termed characteristics. The compounds they appear in are the perception of inconstancy, perception of stress, perception of not-self, and then the word anupasana, which means to contemplate or to keep track of a particular feature of things. Like to contemplate inconstancy means to look for inconstancy wherever you can find it. And you will find it in a lot of places, like that sutta we had just now. Things that are compounded or things that are fabricated are inconstant and they are stressful. And anything that acts as a dhamma, as an object of the mind, is not self. So why make a big deal about this? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. One is that the Buddha's concern is not trying to give an ultimate analysis of things outside. As he once said, all he taught was suffering and the end of suffering, which, as he's pointed out in many places, is essentially an issue of the mind and its search for happiness in the wrong way and the wrong places. We look for happiness that's permanent in things that are impermanent. We look for happiness in things that are stressful. And we look for our happiness and things that are not self, that lie beyond our control. And so what these three perceptions are all about, they're more about our psychology, the way we look for happiness, and how we can learn to look for happiness in the right ways, in the right places. And these are the three features of things that are relevant to trying to find happiness of a true sort, of a lasting sort. So it's good to keep this in mind, because our constantly our focus in the meditation should be looking at the mind. We're not out there trying to analyze things in and of themselves. We're trying to see how the mind relates to things. And you always want to keep your focus here. Even when you focus on the breath, ultimately you're going to find that as the breath gets more and more refined, the sense of ease filling the body, you come to a sense where the mind and the breath seem to become one, and then the mind and its functions become more and more prominent in the meditation. The breath becomes more and more subtle, fades into the background, and it's just as it should be. Because the mind is the culprit, the breath is not the culprit. Things that are in constant stressful and not self, they're not to blame. The problem is the way the mind looks for happiness. Even when it looks for happiness in a wise way, these issues are relevant. As Buddha said, the beginning of wisdom is when you go to someone who's found to happiness and you ask them, what when I do it will be to my long-term welfare and happiness? my long-term welfare and happiness. Those three categories are directly related to, all well, the my is related to not-self, 
Long term is related to inconstancy. Welfare and happiness is related to stress. In other words, as we look for happiness, we're going to be looking first in things that don't really provide an ultimate happiness, but we use them as a path. So at that point, the Buddha doesn't have us focus too much on these three characteristics. Simply, we hold on to different perceptions. The perception of breath, say, or the perception of whatever our meditation object is. Hold that to be prominent. And we actually try to push it in the direction of making it constant and easeful and getting it under control. In this way, we're actually fighting those characteristics as we try to bring the mind into concentration. To push and see how far we can find a happiness based on conditioned things. Because you're going to need that happiness, you're going to need that sense of solid well-being to put yourself in a position where they can look at things very carefully for what they are. As the phrase is, as they've come into being, when you're no longer pushing them. But you've got to push them first. So you keep working in all your activities, trying to keep the mind as still as possible. As constantly still, no matter what the conditions are out there. You have to create the conditions for stillness inside. Create a sense of ease and try to maintain it in all sorts of conditions. Learn to gain more skill, more control here. And at this stage in the game, the issues of inconstancy, stress, and not-self, those apply to the things that would distract you from your concentration. Try to see that no matter how attractive or alluring or interesting other topics might be, they don't measure up to concentration as a source for happiness. And certainly when you fully master concentration and gained, and in the process gained a lot of insights, as the Buddha once said, it's the full mastery of concentration comes only at the state of non-returning. So there's going to be a long period in which you're working, essentially working against the three characteristics, at least as far as your concentration is concerned. You'll use them to analyze, say, your the object of your lust, the object of your anger, anything that would pull you out of concentration. These characteristics are relevant because they're ways of reminding yourself that you can't find true happiness in those objects. So these are you do use these perceptions. On anything that would pull you away from your center. Use these contemplations. And again, the focus is on using the perception as an antidote for a tendency of the mind. After all, these these perceptions are not intended to be a statement of the ultimate nature of things out there. And when you think about it, the ultimate th nature of things out there is really not all that relevant an issue. We don't hang on to things because we think that ha they have an inherent nature. We hang on to them because we think they're going to provide happiness. And what the Buddha is pointing out is that they really don't. Or if they do provide a happiness, it doesn't really measure up. Ultimately, when you've dropped all your other attachments, that's when you turn around and you apply these perceptions to the concentration itself. You see that your state of concentration is composed of five aggregates on a very subtle level, and all these all these aggregates have these characteristics. You apply the perception to them to pry yourself away even from your attachment to concentration. That's you incline the mind to the deathless, and it's interesting they say that that inclination can either take you in two directions. One is it takes you to non-returning, or you delight in your taste of nirvana as a dhamma, as an object of the mind. Or it takes you to full arahantship, when you go beyond even that kind of delight. And it's precisely there with, there with the 
analysis of sabain tamanatha applies, where you see nirvana as a dhamma, as an object of the mind. And as long as it functions in that way, or as long as you perceive it in that way, there's going to be attachment. It's going to be a dhamma. So you have to learn how to overcome that attachment by perceiving it, anatta sanya, as not self. And then the texts say, okay, then at that point you let go of all dhammas. And that's when you see nirvana in another way, not as a dhamma, but as the abandoning of all dhammas. And that's the ultimate. And so at that point, with the, these three perceptions lose their function. They've done their work, and you can put them aside. So remember, we're not here to see the true nature of things in and of themselves, except for the fact, looking to see how their nature makes them inadequate as sources for true happiness. So the emphasis always points back to using these perceptions to counteract unskillful tendencies in the mind, because it's the issues of the mind that are paramount. As John Fuhrer once said, there was a student of his in Singapore who was writing about how his meditation was concerned solely with seeing the three characteristics and everything. And John Fuhrer said, Kip, Said, don't look at things outside. Keep looking back at the mind to see what it is that keeps complaining that they're they're stressful or inconstant in that self. Because the fault lies not with the things; the fault lies with the mind that's looking for happiness in the wrong place. So that's always where your attention it should be turned to looking at the machinations of the mind and using whatever perceptions and means of contemplation can cut through the mind's unskillful habits. To lead to the goal of the teachings, which is an unconditioned happiness. Where you can put all perceptions, skillful and unskillful, aside. 